Hi everyone, Matthew Perkovich here from Matt's Movie Reviews. Just a note that my interview with Stephanie Wynn was recorded prior to the news that AMC Theatres cancelled the scheduled screenings for No Way Back due to pressure from activist groups. While this is extremely unfortunate, No Way Back will soon be available on streaming and DVD, so please do check out NoWayBackFilm.com for all updates. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Matt's Movie Reviews podcast, available on Podbean, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, and Stitcher. Also, please follow Matt's Movie Reviews on Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, Reddit, Instagram, Twitter, and Rumble. And of course, be sure to visit mattsmoviereviews.net for the latest reviews, top 10 lists, and more. Now, on to the show. One night I remember having a dream that I was a boy. I felt so happy after waking up from that dream. It just felt like I was excited to be alive. And then I got up and went and looked in the mirror and just that happiness was like crushed. Based on the information that I had, that medical transition is by far the best treatment and that you are at risk for suicide if you don't follow that path, I thought I only really had one path that I could take. I became alarmed back in 2019 after I realized I was seeing more kids with gender dysphoria and every single one I referred to the gender clinic was being transitioned. So it's often said that puberty blockers are um, reversible, but uh, the majority of children who are started on puberty blockers, over 95%, go on to take cross-sex hormones. Puberty blockers cannot be considered a standalone intervention. If it worked, I'd be very open to it. It's like putting diesel in the petrol tank. There was a study looking at the Swedish population of those who had transitioned that found that those who had transitioned had suicide rates 19 times higher than population matched controls. Puberty blockers followed by cross-sex hormones. The fact they're being offered outside of clinical trials, despite the fact there's so much unknown about long-term risk, is a scandal in and of itself. It's up to us on the left to walk this back. I want liberals to make room for gender diversity, and that includes masculine girls and feminine boys without telling them that they need to leave their sex category because they are different. Like I said, I have to now live with what I've done. These doctors and therapists put me through this. They had no reason to except for the fact that I said it. Hello and welcome to the Matt's Movie Reviews Podcast. I am your host, Matthew Perkovich, and this is episode number 538. Set to have a one-day special theatrical premiere event at AMC theaters across the U.S. on June 21 is no way back. The reality of gender-affirming care. A documentary that delves into the cause and effect of medical practices concerning gender-affirming care that has especially got its grip on a generation of kids and young teens. Featuring interviews with experts in the fields of pediatrics, mental health, as well as heartbreaking testimony from detransitioners, the documentary previously known as Affirmation Generation is an insightful and engrossing film that should be watched by everyone. And joining me now is a licensed marriage and family therapist and associate producer on No Way Out and the host of the You Must Be Some Kind of Therapist podcast, Miss Stephanie Wynn. Stephanie, I thank you so very much for your time today. Glad to be here, Matt. Thanks for having me. As a producer on, on this film and as a, a one of the um, interviewees as well, I'm sure the last couple of months or so has been a whirlwind for you and the other filmmakers associated with the film. You have the premiere coming up. I, I've read as well um, from what your producer told me July is going to be a, um, a DVD release. You've got the name change. You've got all this stuff happening. I'm, 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 I'm sure that uh, all of that uh, whirlwind comes with a lot of excitement as well that this podcast is able now to be seen in theatres because it's not, not often 
that films that delve into this subject go into theaters. So to, for that to happen, I'm sure it's going to be very exciting on, on your end. Yeah, we're really grateful to the distributor that we've partnered with. And we feel like the American public is ready for this. The public sentiment has been changing. It's my understanding that about 75% of Americans at this point feel like the gender stuff has gone too far. We've just seen too many instances of people being hurt, whether it's the detransitioners and their pain and suffering, or the women who have lost sporting competitions to to men who have overtaken them, the women who are getting raped in prisons. Uh, I think a lot of People are feeling like enough is enough. This has gone too far. And trust me, here in Australia, it's there's very same feelings here as well. It's interesting though. I'm trying to think back as to when I kind of caught wind of when all this was happening. It must have been, I think, maybe several years back, especially during the whole kind of Caitlyn Jenner uh, thing. It seemed to me that's when the whole kind of thing about transition, especially when kids and teens were involved really started to pop up in a much more noticeable way and in much more um prolific way yourself in your line of work when did you realize that this was something that was really starting to get a bit out of hand because i know in the film there's a lot of statistics in regards to increase in um our population of teens in our transitioning but yourself as a as a therapist i mean i'm sure you would have made a mental note of you know what i'm coming across this more than often now than ever yeah, definitely. I, I felt that kind of slow creep of what we now know has been an exponential growth curve in the last decade of, of youth identifying as trans. The first time I noticed that this was going to be an issue or a conflict of interest for people was at my first job in community mental health after grad school when we had to house a resident who was male and certainly came across that way in every way and who was actively psychotic and hallucinating, but who claimed to be a female. And uh, the decision was made to house him in a room shared with other females. And one of those females had a previous history of sexual assault, didn't feel safe there and ran away. So that was the first time I was exposed to the fact that uh, so-called trans rights pose conflicts of interest to other people and uh, conflicts that we must navigate in the mental health field. But then things went dormant for a while. And it was just over the years, I would say, starting in 2016 that I did notice especially more young adolescent females identifying as as male or as something else. And it was around 2017, I went to the training in so-called gender affirming care and was taught this new model and um, didn't really know what to make of it. But I tried practicing in good faith according to these assumptions that I was being taught because I, I think I started off with this open-minded attitude like, well, even though this information feels counterintuitive, these people are experts and and they know something I don't. It took years for me to get to the point where I realized I knew something that they didn't and that I had to change path. So during that time between 2016 and 2020, I did see that increasing amount of uh, young young women, especially really identifying as trans or non-binary. And in all cases, there was you know some kind of elephant in the room, whether it was a history of sexual trauma that made them feel dissociated and uncomfortable in their bodies, um, made them feel like maybe their breasts weren't their own or weren't safe, whether it was um, that they were gay and hadn't come to terms with that. Many of these youth did have autistic traits um, and traits of obsessive compulsive disorder, eating disorders, and body dysmorphia. And it felt like as long as I was kind of going along with this narrative that, you know, they are trans if they say they're trans, there's no questions to ask about that. I should just focus on the other mental health stuff and just be grateful that they're open about their gender identity with me in the same way I would be, you know, non judgmental about someone just being open about their sexual orientation. You know, I found that as long as I was doing that, it, it felt like there was something that we were leaving out. And then it was the moments where I actually saw young people moving toward medicalization that it really started to feel very real because I'd worked with people in all stages and I had never gone on to that next level of training where we were expected that there was sort of a social pressure at the company I worked for to go on to the next level of training where where we would actually be taught to write these letters um, according to the standards of the WPATH standards of care seven at the time. And um, so although I didn't 
participate in that way. I think when I actually saw young people thinking that they wanted to move forward with some medical intervention that they hadn't, uh, of course, if part of me felt like, oh, wow, this is really real. And as much as I'd been kind of going along with the name or the pronouns, there was a part of me thinking, wow, is this really necessary? And mm. is this really going to be the best long-term outcome for them? And then it's when I learned that detransitioners existed that I knew there was another side of the story. That was three years ago in 2020 that I first heard about detransitioners through podcasts. And the moment I heard about them, I found out that they were being silenced. So that's when I started, you know, going down the detrans YouTube rabbit hole and um, learning all about their stories. And at the time, I didn't know any other therapists that were talking about these issues. I I thought I was all alone. Um, and But since I have come out, I found so many concerned citizens and sadly, so many detransitioners that have lost trust in my profession. So I see it as kind of my job to try to make amends for what the counseling profession has gotten wrong. What I find really interesting is that a lot of the high profile, I guess, maybe celebrity cases, uh, um, cases of um, male to female transitions. So um, Caitlyn Jenner, Leah Thomas, Dylan Mulvaney, et cetera. But the numbers show that it's more females than males. Um, that are transitioning, and you mentioned that yourself in your, in, in what we just said, Dan, in, in your experience with that. Why is it that there is more female to male? Is does that have to do with social things? Does that has to do with the type of drugs that are associated? Because I imagine a young teen female taking uh, hormones and testosterone. From what I, from what I, I I've read and in, in, in listened and in, in heard, um, that those first few months and weeks of being on that testosterone is kind of like almost like a is almost euphoric kind of feeling for a lot of these um, young ladies. Is that is that something that uh, it's a big factor in that as well? Well, I think there are a lot of factors. And as you said, I, I think if I understand correctly, the ratio right now is about four to one um, females to males um, who are identifying as trans or non-binary or something else. And to me, what that points to is what we've always known about this population, adolescent girls, they are the most susceptible to social contagions. And we have evidence of this in the past from, you know, whether it was the social contagions of anorexia and bulimia and cutting or hysterias of the past, um, you know, in, in the, at some point in the 1800s, I think you had listomania, all these girls going crazy for this classical music composer. I mean, it sounds silly now from our mm -hmm. modern perspective, because classical music isn't a thing that girls are into now. But, mm -hmm. um, but if you look at almost uh, any era, you, you'll, you'll find these, these moments in history that a group of girls get swept up in a trend. And, and we know that because of the, the development of the adolescent female brain. There's, there's so much going on between hormones and this budding social consciousness and trying to find one's place and fit in with their peers and girls' tendency to be more agreeable and neurotic than boys. These all kind of make girls ripe for social contagions. And I think that's what we're seeing. I want to talk about the social media effect on all of this. And we know that social media does have a huge effect in regards to the influence on a lot of these teenagers, especially um, TikTok, Tumblr is something that was really um, prevalent in the in your documentary, No Way Out, is something I think um, I think maybe it was Michelle or Kat was talking about looking at Tumblr quite a bit and, and how that had an effect on them. Um, something I'm really curious about, though, is there any studies that or any observations that you have in regards to the social media effect pre-COVID as opposed to post-COVID? Because during that lockdown period, everyone was online. And I'm curious as to because everyone was online and everyone's eyes were glued to the screen more than ever during that time, whether there was even more of an influence from social media, I guess, influences, you can call them, in regards to the trans space, because that's something I think that um, could be, you know, something that's really relevant in this discussion. It's a good question. Valid observation, something I've certainly thought about and other people have as well. I don't know of any studies in particular on that. I think the pandemic certainly pushed a lot more people to be a lot more online. Um, and the the results of that are mixed because with the trans social contagion, some of that was coming from peer groups at school. So I'm sure there have been families where um, having time away from peers actually allowed them to get into something else. But yeah, I mean, a lot of kids having a lot of unmonitored time on the internet, parents either not knowing what all they were being exposed to on the internet or just being too busy or stressed to have a handle on things or maybe to parents not being tech savvy enough to know how to um, monitor and control their kids' internet usage. Um, whenever people ask me for studies or statistics, uh, I, I recommend statsforgender.org. That's a really good um, database. 
So a lot of this points to, in the documentary, to the influence of big pharma, um, medicine, the money. It's always, you follow the money and a lot of times you can find where a lot of stuff is coming from. Um, and it's really fascinating watching this film because I never thought of it before, but the film does um, make correlations with how the opioid epidemic took hold as well. You have these sales, sales reps that were influencing local doctors. The local doctors were prescribing these pills. Uh, the pills go to the patients. The patients get hooked. And then you've got a big epidemic happening. And it's something that seems eerily familiar happening with this whole kind of trends, and especially of teens and kids as well. Um, as yourself, as a, as a practitioner, when it comes to prescribing medicines, prescribing drugs, et cetera, what is usually the process when it comes to prescribing? Because I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm reading conflicting things because in a documentary and other places, I've, I've, I see that some places will just give kids the drugs on the spot, um, especially when it comes to those hormones in the first stages of, of transition, um, without parents consent, whatever other places you need to go through um, uh, mental evaluation, et cetera. What is the actual um, processes of that right now? I mean, is it changing now from state to state? I know Florida's doing stuff. I know Tennessee's doing stuff. Or as a federal kind of national thing, um, is it still the case where a lot of these kids are getting their hands on these drugs um, without even the consent of their parents? Yeah, so a lot of important points there. Absolutely follow the money. Look at what's going on with big pharma. Now, the, the trends have changed rapidly, and they varied according to state laws, and that's something that even I can't keep up with, but there has been mm -hmm. this increasing shift toward what's called the informed consent model, meaning there used to be more barriers, um, but what the trans rights activists and uh, especially the ones in the medical field believe is that what they call gatekeeping is a form of bigotry. So the idea is your gender identity is precious, innate, immutable, knowable only to you. Who am I to judge? Who am I to ask any questions? If you say you're trans, you are. My job is to affirm that. And so I don't want to gatekeep you. That's that's the logic. And you'll even hear Abel Garcia, one of our detransitioners in our film, say that that was what the therapist said to him on the first visit. Well, I don't want to gatekeep you. So there's this whole um, gatekeeping is like a four-letter word, this idea that a professional should use their standing as a professional to exert any caution whatsoever is really frowned upon by these activists. So they think that it is the job of the professional to simply affirm and try to remove as many barriers as possible. And so there's been this shift to the informed consent model, which um, I think is a misnomer because how can one really consent? How can one really be informed if you're caught up in a social contagion, your brain hasn't fully developed, and we uh, there's a lot that's still unknown and that's not and and there's a lot that is known that's not being really communicated adequately to these young people about what it is that they're signing up for. But, you know, here in Oregon, I know that at least if you're 18, you can just walk into a Planned Parenthood and get whatever you want. But then with some of our recent legislation in, in states like Oregon, as well as other um, blue states, there is a shift toward trying to lower the age um, or remove any age limits whatsoever so that any type of child can just go to a doctor and say, I'm trans, and then walk out with a prescription for puberty blockers or cross-sex hormones. The Matt's Movie Reviews podcast is brought to you by Tee Public. Tee Public is the world's largest marketplace for independent creators to sell their work on the highest quality merchandise. With over 1.2 million designs, Tee Public is sure to have something you will love. The Matt's Movie Reviews Podcast is brought to you by Amazon. The world's leading online store, Amazon is your first stop to buy a wide range of products at competitive prices with fast delivery times. Amazon is also a world-class entertainment hub that includes Prime Video, Audible, Twitch, Amazon Music, and more. Sign up with Amazon today and experience the best in online shopping and entertainment. Please support Matt's movie reviews on Patreon. Get access to exclusive content, request movie reviews and top 10 lists, and help support my work. Please click on the Patreon link in the description below. It's incredibly scary to me as a parent when hearing things like that, um, because when reading and hearing about the processes of transing, 
I mean, I, in, I don't mean this in a kind of like a sensationalist way, but it kind of, kind of almost feels like I'm, I'm listening to like a body horror movie, like a David Cronenberg film or something. It starts with the hormones and then it goes to the puberty blockers. The puberty blockers themselves have devastating effects on the body, don't they? Because if you're blocking the natural process of puberty, doesn't that have um, really dire effects on bone structure and brain development and such? I mean, isn't that something that, I mean... I know that the first um, oath of of doctors and medical practitioners and psychiatrists, what have you, is first do no harm. Isn't doesn't that shouldn't that be ringing bells alone that such medications can have such an effect on children, and yet they diagnosed and, and given out like candy anyway? I mean, it just it's really um, uh, alarming to me. Absolutely. So just to issue a slight correction, it would, uh, if a young person were to seek so-called gender affirming care, it would start with puberty blockers and then go on to cross-sex hormones. Um, And then there are people who um, maybe just start with cross-sex hormones. Maybe it's too late for puberty blockers, but you're absolutely right. Um, There's, there's a lot of kind of wishful magical thinking amongst gender ideologues about the degree to which we can control the human body through through these novel drugs and procedures. But the reality is, uh, if you look at how puberty blockers actually function, so uh, puberty blockers are GnRH agonists, uh, gonadotropin releasing hormones agonists, and the most common brand name that a lot of people are familiar with is Lupron. Um, but they, they affect the brain, right? Puberty is it originates in in the pituitary gland, the endocrine system, the brain. It's a whole cascading series of events that the brain and body is orchestrating together to facilitate one of the most powerful maturational periods in a person's life. You can't just pick and choose which elements of puberty you want to be able to control to get whatever desired appearance to suit your so-called gender identity. So you're really interfering with brain development including um, the development of romantic feelings, the growth of the prefrontal cortex. Absolutely, you're interfering with bone development. Puberty is one of the most important points in life for the um, strengthening of the skeletal system. And so you have 15-year-olds now with osteoporosis. Um, And we also know that puberty blockers are associated with brain swelling that can lead to even blindness. And then if you look at um, other instances in which Lupron has been used, it's been used in the chemical castration of sex offenders. So it's been used to destroy people's sex drives and sexual functionings. Um, and if you look at Lupron, there there have been lawsuits for um, people who took them for precocious puberty and women who took them for endometriosis and conditions like that. It's a nasty, nasty drug. And uh, and you worry about the psychological well-being of people who had such an important brain maturation process interfered with, um, and it's halting the very process by which gender dysphoria naturally deceases, or excuse me, desists, because um, young people who struggle with being the sex that they are naturally will grow out of that in the vast majority of cases. And what helps them grow out of it is grappling with the ups and downs of puberty, coming to terms with their sexuality and growing into their fully matured bodies. Another problem with puberty blockers, as uh, Dr. Will Malone points out in our film, No Way Back, is that they're not a standalone intervention. They're sold as this idea of time to think, but the 95% plus of kids who go on puberty blockers go on to cross-sex hormones. Whereas if you Mm -hmm. don't medicalize, kids can desist. So it's it's a very dangerous pathway. And it bothers me as a mental health practitioner that people are doing this in the name of mental health and suicide prevention, especially because puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones actually set people up for more suicide risk factors down the line. We know that having chronic pain, disabilities, and um, being physically incapable of doing things that you enjoy and that keep you well are risk factors for suicide. And we're actually increasing those risk factors in anyone that uh, receives so-called gender affirming care. Another thing that was really interesting about No Way Out is how it talks about how the um, lesbian and and gay groups really are trying really hard to disassociate themselves from a lot of the trans activists because their feeling is they're being painted with the same brush uh, uh, that the controversy that these processes have gone through. And I think that's a really important point that a lot of people need to get, you know, need need to really dive into because while the letters are all bunched together in a nice little package, there are 
these we're talking about different people going through different things here. You know, a trans person is not the same as a lesbian person. There's different things going on here, every person. However, in the context of the greater scheme of thing, everyone does see it in the same package. We are in Pride Month right now. Throughout different places around the world, flags are being raised. I don't know if you saw Justin Trudeau in Canada raised the um, Pride flag um, in front of their parliament. At, at the White House, you've got the Pride flag. Up in in a big thing that this 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 thing is now going to federal. It's becoming politics. It's becoming law in some cases. California is talking about, um, you know, penalties towards parents that don't confirm uh, affirm their kids. That or other people do it as well. Do you think that this kind of talk and this kind of overall acceptance of this gender affirming care um, as a whole, as a cultural thing as well as a medical thing, is something that's just gonna grow bigger like a big snowball or do you think that with all the tra- the transitioners coming out and uh, medical experts like yourself and so many others in 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 your documentary will will thaw away at this big snowball and hopefully we'll find try to find some more clarity some more clarification and hopefully you know and not to say you know kind of to not to lump people into saying they're they're mad or insane but some sanity in a debate of everything because i just think everything is just going so fast and people are just embracing this so quickly that the rational debate and discussion is just not being had here. Well, you brought up a couple different important issues there, Matt. So one is that gender identity and sexual orientation are two completely different things. And yeah. the the TQ plus has latched on to the LGB in almost this parasitic way Um, gender identity and sexual orientation are actually completely at odds with each other. In order to have gay rights, in order to acknowledge and make room in society to respect gay and lesbian people, you have to respect the reality of our sexed bodies and that what is a homosexual person? It is a person who's attracted to someone of the same sex. Gender identity uh, ideology seeks to eradicate those boundaries. It seeks to say that a man can become a lesbian. So how how are gay rights and uh, the things that trans activists are demanding to even coexist in the same space? They are they are not and, um, the same. Sorry thing. to interrupt there, but there's a line in the film I remember where one one of the um uh, uh one of the activists was talking about how at first we said born this way, and then some other people were saying born in the wrong body. It's just like two different ideologies that just clash right there, just just in those phrases alone. Yeah, absolutely. It was it was quite a slate of hand. And what a loaded phrase, by the way, the idea of being born in the wrong body. Now, there's mm. there's something I want to mention, you know, on this topic of sexual orientation versus gender identity. I said this on Twitter recently, it got a lot of attention. And I think this is something we need to be talking about more. So I'll take the opportunity, which is that it is fundamentally a healthier stance um, to be relationship oriented than to be uh, overly fixated on yourself. In other words, to be Mm -hmm. interested in other people and then to be self-obsessed, right? Sexual orientation is about your interest in other people. It's about, I mean, it's not saying you are exclusively only curious about people of whatever sex, but, but you're driven to connect intimately with certain people. And so sexual orientation is about saying, um, I'm I'm going to love who I love, right? Gender identity is not about love. It's not about relationships. It's not that healthy curiosity and interest in other people in the world around you. It is fundamentally a self-fixation. And it's oftentimes at the expense of relational health. A lot of these young people who are getting wrapped up in gender identity ideology haven't even had relational experiences. And they're becoming so fixated on who am I and what is my gender identity and how do I get the world to affirm that, even at the expense of their reproductive potential, their capacity to engage in healthy and fulfilling sexual relationships with other people. So... I just wanted to make that distinction. But you also asked yeah. sort of which way are things going as a society? And that's a question that I get asked a lot. And I think it's moving in both directions at the, th- at the same time. Because on the one mm-hmm. hand, I mean, here in the United States, I- I'm sure things are going to the Supreme Court because we have some states like mine, unfortunately, Oregon, Washington, California, and a lot of other blue states that are writing these um these kind of horrifying laws that um you know enable gender transition hormones and surgeries for people of all ages and that even encourage minors to run away from home 
to these so-called sanctuary states, which really just makes them uh, ripe for sex trafficking and all sorts of abuses and Mm. enabling the child protective services system, which is really there to intervene in cases of extreme abuse or neglect. They're getting those resources wrapped up in triangulating families where the parents are actually just trying to protect their kids from making rash decisions. So on the one hand, some of our states are moving in that direction. On the other hand, other states like Texas and many others are banning these drugs and surgeries for minors. And at the same time, we have lawsuits. We have several lawsuits going on in the United States right now and uh, and no results of any of those yet. So I think things are moving in both directions at the same time. Oh, my final question here. Um, I think yourself speaking out about this and other people as well in your field and other medical fields as well is incredibly brave because the pressure is really there whether it be from you know um, places like um, the the National Pediatri- uh, Pediatrics Association or just popular culture or politics, et cetera, to just go along with the whole affirming process and to speak out about it um, does come with consequences. Only here in Australia, like yesterday, we had a, um, a senior child psychologist at the um, uh, Queensland Hospital. She got fired for speaking out in regards to gender um, gender affirming care. She was speaking at a protest and talking about how um, her her opinion is that this is not the way we should go. She was only fired like yesterday for it, um, which is just like really fresh news that came in Australia. And it's, a lot of people are calling for uh, inquiry into gender affirming care in that state at that hospital. So when people do speak out about this, there can be consequences for that. But you've done so. Other people in the documentary, No Way Out, have done so as well. Um, do you think that, in just speaking on your own behalf, that the time has come now for more people to speak out? Because I think that the more debate is on the table and more people talk about it, I think that after when that happens, the evidence is very clear as to which way the future of this should go. And where you said just now that there will be a split, I think the split is only more more ideological than it is um, evidence-based. That's what I, I, I truly think. I think a lot of what's happening now is that people just digging their heels in and refusing to see what the other side is saying. And unfortunately, the other side being your side, our side, um, we're saying really relevant things here. And unfortunately, it just seems like either we are being censored for it or being punished for it. And I think it's really incredibly unfair. And I and I truly hope that that isn't something that's happening to you because what I think you're doing uh, with your podcast and with your appearance in the film and producing No Way Out is a, a very brave and, and, uh, and thing. And we're very grateful for that. Mm, thank you. So um, that reminds me of uh, James Essis. Do you know him? He's in the UK. Okay. And he he's a, he's a lovely person who just happened to go to grad school to study therapy at the wrong moment in history. Mm. Um, he basically got kicked out of his grad program for taking a stance against the idea that puberty blockers were a good treatment for distressed children. And now in the UK, his country where this happened, the NHS has just reversed their decision and said that puberty blockers shall not be administered to children outside of clinical trials, which is a big win. And it's what James S. has got kicked out of grad school for. It's like, mm. where's where's the redemption? But I agree that the more the merrier. My stance on this is uh, we're not we're not going down without a fight. Um, I I decided at some point that I was going to put up a fight. And, um, you know, I, I have been targeted. I've, I've had complaints made against my license. Um, I've been accused of doing so-called conversion therapy simply for speaking on this issue. And so where I draw the line is I don't do anything that could remotely resemble conversion therapy. I work with, uh, I'm open to working with detransitioners. I work with a lot of parents who are worried about their kids. And I'm a therapist that is actually going to treat them in a client-centered way rather than telling them that they are a bigot. Um, so that is appropriate for the populations that I serve. But, um, you know, the, the more of us who join in taking a stance, the faster we're going to get this all over. You know, there there really is no consensus at all in the medical field or in the mental health field that so-called gender-affirming care is safe, effective, or medically necessary. There's never been any consensus, but there are a lot of people who are getting away with 
making it look like there is. So I just think all of us with any ground to stand on whatsoever should make it clear that there isn't that consensus. And I would encourage people to, you know, for other therapists, I encourage them to use their own decatastrophizing tools to think about what's the worst that could happen and what would you do to cope? Because um, ultimately, if your license gets threatened or even revoked, I mean, I defended my license successfully. I think it takes a lot to revoke a license, but worst case scenario, your license gets revoked for standing up to protect vulnerable people from harm. Um, do, do you fundamentally have any trust in, in the goodness of the universe that there's something else that you could be doing to survive after that? Because I, I do, that's, that's what I had to come to. It was like, if, if I lose my license to practice therapy over taking a stance to defend the integrity of my profession, then my profession is a lost cause and I will find something else to do that I can sell to people who appreciate the stance that I'm taking. Well, I I do appreciate that and so many other people do as well. And for everyone out there listening, no way back the reality of gender affirming care. Um, June 21 across the US AMC theaters, I recommend you go to those sessions and watch it. You can go to nowaybackfilm.com to find out more information uh, about uh, screen times and other things as well. You can also check out Stephanie's podcast, You Must Be Some Kind of Therapist at sometherapist.com. And I'm sure that's available in all the usual places, your uh, Spotify's and et cetera. Um, and I, I really recommend people check out this film because I've watched a lot of films um, in regards to this subject. And I think this movie, No Way Out, is one of the best ones, if not the best one I've seen so far, because not only is it does it show a, a breadth of information in regards to it, but I think it does that really necessary thing where it takes the uh, the scientific and the humane and brings it all together. It tells stories from all different perspectives. And I think that's something that's really important. And something that you and I have been stressing about, it's about, about getting people together to have to talk and debate about this and, and just talk about just how important it is that this subject is um, discussed. And also, um, yeah, just some of the... Uh, the revelations that came from this documentary is just incredible to me. And as a parent and, and just as a concerned citizen in my own country, I think it's incredibly relevant that people watch this movie and important. And um, Stephanie, thank you so much for your time today. Best of luck with the film's uh, premi uh, premiere um, at the AMC Theatres on June 21. And um, yeah, I, I hope we can talk again in the future. It's been a pleasure. Thanks so much, Matt. Thank you for watching the Matt's Movie Reviews channel. Please subscribe for more reviews podcast interviews, and exclusive content. Also, if you would like to request a review and support my work, please join my Patreon via the link in the description below.